Mm-hmm. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's edition of A Sip of Knowledge with Marty Duffy, Liz Rhodes, and Lou Bryson, plus this week's special guest, Michael Veach, who I will let your hosts give a more formal introduction to in just a moment. Before I turn things over, I'm Will Hookinga from Zavi.co. And as always, just want to point out a few ways that you can interact with your hosts and their guests throughout the live stream today. So on your right, there's a chat box. Uh, t- tell everyone hello. Let us know uh, where you're joining us from. It's always cool to see people joining in from around the world. Uh, at the bottom, there's a little button that says ask a question. So if you have a question for Michael or for any of your hosts at any point during the presentation, just tap that button type your question in and uh, I'll be keeping an eye out for those. And uh, last but not least, uh, invite your friends to join us. There's a share button at the top that makes it really easy to do that. But with that said, Marty, Liz, Lou, I'll turn things over to you now. Thank you, Will. I don't know if Obi-Wan ever told you about your father, but it, hello. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone, Martin Duffy. Uh, former senior master of whiskey for Diageo for about, seemed like uh, three decades, but it was actually 14 years. Um, uh, for 18 glorious months, uh, sold North no American way. brand ambassador. Oh my God, look at that shirt! Benedictine. I made this. That's Back awesome. Today, I found it in my archives. <laughs> my archives, Mike. <laughs> Uh, then for eight glorious years, I was co-producer of Chicago Independent Spirit Expo. And for the last nearly seven, going on seven years, pretty soon, uh, sole North American brand representative for the Glen Cairn Crystal Company out of Scotland. By the way, I'm drinking a little wee whiskey called, look at that, Wee Man's Blend. <laughs> Is a blended uh, malt whiskey by Andy Davidson, the youngest of the Davidsons who uh, own Glen Karen. He blended his own whiskey. Hell so, nice. yeah, doing that. Hello. Uh, Lizard. Thanks, Marty. Thanks. Uh, actually, I'm going to start calling you Rocky. Rocky Rhodes. I think that's I, a nice one. I'll, I'll respond to it. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Um, hey, everyone, thanks for joining. I'm Liz Rhodes, technical distiller and spirit consultant. have just over a decade of experience in alcoholic beverage, spanning across several different substrates and products, including beer, rum, vodka. But my particular favorite and expertise is in whiskey, of course. Um, spent most of my career at a, a tiny mom and pop known as Diageo, but I'm currently now founder and principal at Spirit Safe Consulting. Uh, I'm actually out on the road this week, um, which is really exciting. Uh, but if you do want to learn more about what Spirit Safe Consulting is about, if you scroll down to the About the Host section, there's a link to my website. So click it. Check it out. Lou? Thanks, Liz. I'm Lou Bryson. I am a uh, I'm a whiskey and beer writer. Uh, have been for quite a while. I was the uh, managing editor at Whiskey Advocate magazine for uh, 20 years, and uh, I'm now freelance again, um, working as a uh, senior drinks writer for the Daily Beast website, the award-winning Daily Beast half full website. Um, I'm in really plugging my uh, latest book, Whiskey Masterclass, and of course the classic tasting whiskey. Thank you, Marty. Um, I, and I want to thank Liz, um, your uh, good guy friends that uh, you recommended to me. I've actually been expanding on what I learned about proofing in that book for an article I'm working on. Your guys have been hugely helpful. Thank you. Good. Thank you. I like I, I said to one of them, I feel like I've stumbled into this dark room in the in the distilling building that I'd never, never, I'm currently stumbling around banging my shins on shit. So it's, it's amazing how much, sorry, adding water to whiskey is an amazing process. It's just incredible. I, I'm learning so much in just the space of a week. Anyway, sorry, I'm rambling on and on. Uh, my whiskey today that I'm I'm drinking as we do the show is the new uh, Evan Williams Small Batch, 1783. Um, just got that yesterday, and I am happily sipping away on this. It's you know old, new, familiar, wonderful, 
all that jazz. <laughs> and that's it for me, Marty. All right. Honors. Thank you, Lewis. Um, uh, this week, everyone, uh, we're very happy to have an old friend, a gentleman who, uh, much like Cher or Madonna, really only goes by one name, and that's Veach. The, the Veach. Uh, the Veach. Um, the, oh, uh, I, I had a question about bourbon. Who do I talk to? The Veach. That's it. Uh, he is a whiskey uh, historian, archivist. Uh, he was former archivist at Stitzelweller, and we'll talk about that. Um, he is an author, wrote a book, Kentucky Bourbon Whiskey, which is like a kind of redundant in a lot of ways. But yeah, easy, easy. Whoa, whoa, whoa. But it's an American heritage. And look, that's a lot of knowledge in just a few pages. But it's I, I quoted his book in my book. Yeah, and I quoted Lou's acknowledgement of me in the times. Um, so there's that. Um, also, uh, you know, basically Mike is like the Indiana Jones of uh, bourbon. If it was played by the guy from Office Space. Will, you got that? Oh, my God. Will, you there? All right, never um, mind. Will, Will is there, there it is. is. There <laughs> it is. <laughs> Played by that actor. That's Indiana Jones, and that would be the Mike Beach story. But, it, but it's missing a hat. Well, the, I thought the brace kind of acted like a hat. It was some substitute of a hat. Like an inverted hat. <laughs> All right. Another Young hat. Michael Beach, how are you, fella? Doing great. Thanks for having me. You seem like you're off in the distance. Off in the distance. Yeah, so you're such a small closer. guy compared to the rest of us now. There you go. There's a little better. <laughs> Actually, you know, you look a lot like Dave Wondrich. We had Dave on a couple of who gave you a lot of. Does look a lot like Dave. That beard is really yeah. giving him a Wondrichy look. Yeah, <laughs> Wondrichy. Uh, a Wondrichy look. Yeah, Wondrichy. <laughs> That's an adjective. People use it <laughs> all the time. All the time, Michael. What we usually do is we ask folks, hey, man, how'd you get where you are today? What was your journey like? And will you take us on that journey? Will you take us back in time and then bring us back again through time on that journey? So could you uh, tell us where'd you start and how'd you get to where you are today? Well, I always tell people I'm the luckiest student to come out of the University of Louisville's history department. <laughs> I, you know, when I got out of high school in 76, I just kind of worked a lot of dead end jobs, but had a lot of fun going to concerts and, you know, doing, doing all the, the fun things that you should do when you first get out of high school, but you should probably quit after a year or two. Well, it took me about 10 or 12 years before I quit doing it. <laughs> so I decided to go back to college and I decided I was always good in history. So I would, uh, get a, uh, a degree in history and do a secondary field in uh, uh, public history and study archives because, you know, what else can you do with a history degree, basically, besides teach? So I was working on my master's degree when Nick Morgan called uh, the university and said they, they were putting together a uh, uh, North American Archive for United Distillers out at Stitzel Weller and was looking for a graduate student. To, well, actually, when he called, it was old Fitzgerald. They hadn't changed it back to Stitzel Weller yet. <laughs> and when was that? It was, still, it, it was uh, 91, summer of 91. And they were still distilling there. Uh, matter of fact, they quit distilling while I was doing the work there. Uh, oh, a, a connection, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they had just finished up the new Bernheim distillery and they decided they didn't need the Stitzelweller. Uh, of course, you know, 91, bourbon was still in a slump. You know, they could hardly give it away. Uh, but we started putting together the archive uh, on a part time basis. Uh, uh, they told me the job would be six weeks during the summer, 35 hours a week and uh, uh, $9 an hour, which I was all for as a graduate student and needing to work full time during the summer. I didn't have classes. So I go in there and they kept bringing more and more materials in until 
uh, finally, I had to go back and complete classwork. <laughs> they told me to keep working at it part time, uh, you know, 10 to 20 hours a week until I finished my classwork. Then they hired me full time. So I spent uh, four years full time with uh, United Distillers and uh, uh, learned a lot. Uh, I still think of the, uh, the person that had the most influence on me was Mike Wright, the head of quality control. Uh, was he there when you started there at Diageo, Marty? Me? No. Well, if he was, I wasn't dealing with I think after person. they closed, you know, they sold Burnham and closed it, you know, most operations were, he got shipped to Illinois to uh, their plant there, but I'm not field. sure where he is now. That's where Liz used to work. Mm -hmm. And, um, but Mike Wright had one of the best pallets in the world and it was a wonderful teacher. Ta and I was fortunate enough that when I started there, they were going through a uh, uh, barrel sampling thing where they take having arrow in the warehouses there being tasted. The 10, 10 tastings a, a day for every day, Monday through Friday, you go into the quality control trailer, you would sample these. They were looking for bad whiskey because um, they had a lot of musty whiskey there where a couple of distillations had gotten by with some musty corn. Yeah. And they were looking to weed it out and uh, basically re, uh, have it redistilled into your gas tank. But um, I started doing the archives there and uh, uh, almost immediately uh, uh, Glenmore got purchased and I started working with Chris Morris. He was technically my boss there uh, uh, for the archives. And well, my real boss was Nick Morgan out of England. But um, we did a lot of stuff trying to revive old brands and such. We did a few projects where we did uh, revive the old James E. Pepper brand for Eastern Europe for a while. Uh, then we did the uh, uh, Bourbon Heritage Collection. And then we did those uh, Henry Clay and Joseph Finch rare bourbons. Um, did the research and everything for that. But eventually they sold off all their bourbon brands except for I.W. Harper and uh, 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 closed the archives and laid me off, which turned out to be one of the luckiest things that ever happened to me because um, Jim Holmberg out the Filson knew I was available and he hired me there as an archivist. And all of a sudden, I was then um, brand neutral. The other distilleries didn't see me as the competition. So I was mm -hmm. able to do bourbon history and help them out. Uh, you know, there for many years, if you had called the dis uh, distillery with a question about a bottle label or something, they'd give you my number at the Filson and I'd take your call. You know, and I helped them put the history together for their visitor centers and things like that. And, uh, in 2006, they showed their appreciation by uh, making me a member of the Kentucky Bourbon Hall of Fame. Then yeah. in 2013, I my book came out. Uh, it took a while for me to do it. The University Press approached me about doing it, and I was yeah said I really didn't have time to to do that, do a book. And they said, "Well, oh, you don't understand. What we're really looking for is a good." concise history that'll sell well in the new, all these new bourbon gift shops. So that's why I wrote for them. And, and you go back, Mike. I mean, and it, it, it is a good solid history. Yeah. I mean, you go oh, back. Yeah. To, uh, uh, you know, I explore a few things in there that nobody explored before. I know. Uh, uh, um, it's very you know. adult. Well, yeah. also, I mean, I got to say, speaking as an editor, the concise thing is way underrated. I think it's awesome to have that concentrated yeah. a book in that package, you know, I mean, too many of them, they just put every damn thing in. And when you put every damn thing in, you're getting some crap in your book is, well, your book is distilled. It's the essence. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and Mike, is it? Well, I'm it, proud of it. The, the only thing I, I, I fought and fought with the university press about a lot of things, won a few battles, but the one I lost and I really wish I hadn't, <laughs> I wanted to call it simply bourbon whiskey and American heritage. They insisted on having Kentucky in it. If they hadn't put Kentucky in it, I imagine they'd have sold another 
50,000 copy to all these uh, distilleries in other states that are making mm -hmm. perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, Mike, uh, you do, or you were doing a class. Uh, it was basically an eight hour class. I'm still uh, doing it. I haven't done it the past year because of COVID, but I still do it. I got several people that are talking to me about doing it now. Yeah, but you were doing it. Let me finish, Mister. Okay. Because I will crush you like a bug. Um, <laughs> uh, it you was uh, you were doing it at the Filson Heritage uh, uh, Historic Historical Society, uh, and you're uh, it was two hours a week for four weeks, uh, and then you condensed it based on the suggestion of a certain somebody and took it on the road uh, into a full eight hour long, and I mean a lot of this is really that eight hour class just, and it, you start yes. from way back in like the beginning of American history. It's not just a hey, bourbon started in the, uh, you know, late 1700s. You go way back to the first mentions of whiskey in the U S which I, you know, I hadn't really seen anywhere before. Yeah. Well, you know, the more I looked at it, the more I found out, you know, like the Elijah Craig story, uh, yes, Elijah Craig was a distiller. We know that. But uh, the first written mention of bourbon is 1821. So uh, you can't tell me if That's Elijah bourbon. Craig invented bourbon in 1789, it took 32 years before someone started advertising it in a newspaper. Well, why not? So and, you bring that up, Mike. Why don't you? Uh, Liz had never heard your so theory. So my theory: the more I, the more research that I've done, and the more people I talk to, this is something uh, I. Ha it's a theory still. I don't don't have definite proof of this, but uh, it's got to be out there somewhere. My theory is is that that I know from working at the Filson that. Trade to New Orleans was uh, sporadic, at least before the Louisiana Purchase. Mm. The, the Spanish uh, uh, didn't allow it uh, for many, many years. Uh, they were using it as a bargaining piece with the new American government. But mm -hmm. the new American government was all based on the uh, uh, eastern sea coast. And Kentucky was the only one that was really worried about trade with New Orleans. Uh, so the government really didn't give a damn about doing anything about it. As a matter of fact, people in Kentucky very, very much considered leaving the new United States and joining Spain because their economic ties were more with St. Louis and uh, New Orleans. Mm. So they started uh, uh, sending whiskey down there. You know, and the, the, the story about bourbon getting its name from Bourbon County comes from the fact that, you know, they're saying that invoices had Bourbon County on it because it was being shipped out of uh, 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 the Port of Limestone, which is now Maysville, Kentucky, uh, out of Bourbon County. Well, the one problem with that is, is that Maysville was only part of Bourbon County for a couple of years. And in those years uh, that trade with, uh, New Orleans was illegal. Yes, there was trade going on, but it's a thing called smuggling, and smugglers don't write invoices, at least the <laughs> ones, ones that don't get caught. I was going to say, not successful <laughs> ones, no. Real, real <laughs> anal ones do. <laughs> Wait a minute. I need an invoice on that, Mr. So, Pilot. I know from the research at the Filson and Kentucky Historical Society uh, of people that were making this journey, you know, in the 18 teens, for the most part, the price of whiskey in New Orleans was the same as it was in Kentucky. So why bother? If you can sell your whiskey for the same price here in Kentucky, why oh, yeah. ship it and pay the money? And mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you took more profitable things like tobacco, which was selling for a lot of money in New Orleans. So they weren't buying our whiskey. So the question was, you know, someone had to ask the question, you know, who are these people? What are they drinking? 
Well, they're Frenchmen. New Orleans is a French colony. What are they drinking? They're drinking French brandy. Hmm. One of the things that makes French brandy special is it's aged in charred barrels. It has been since the 1400s. So let's make our whiskey taste more like French brandy. Let's put it in a charred barrel and age it. And it worked. And <laughs> Later, I, my theory is, is that people got down there and really liked that whiskey that they were drinking down there on Bourbon Street. And, you know, and they started, you know, particularly after 1818, when the steamboats start making trips up and down the river, you know, the one independent person on a steamboat, everybody on the steamboat worked for the owners, except for one person. And that's the bartender, the bartender. <laughs> The bartender had to furnish his own whiskeys and spirits, beer, whatever. He, but he uh, paid a little rent for setting up a bar on the boat, and he served the customers on the boat. Now, you got to realize that most steamboats were more uh, cargo carriers than passenger carriers. So, you know, there may have only been 20, 30 people on the boat paying customers. But still... You got paying customers that say, you know, I really like that whiskey I was drinking down there on Bourbon Street. Give me some of that Bourbon Street whiskey or eventually give me some of that bourbon whiskey. Which makes That's sense. Shit happens. A lot of whiskey well, history. Stories, you know, the stories about Elijah Craig and the story about Bourbon County, the earliest references I could find to them are 1870. You know, and the Elijah That's true Craig, of a lot of this American history that it seemed like there was a like a wholesale industry for making shit up in the 1870s. Well, I'll tell you why they happened in the 1870s. There's a little thing called the temperance movement. <laughs> and they knew that Elijah Craig was a Baptist minister. So they thought, let's say he made the first bourbon and then let the Baptist deal with that. <laughs> also, if you interweave it with American history, then it also becomes patriotic. But, you know, it's not just American history. I mean, you know, it was about the 1870s that Bushmills was pushing that they're the oldest distillery. Yes, the, and right? the triangle trade, the whole idea of yeah. the molasses Roman slaves thing came first mentioned in the 1870s yeah. after it was over. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of that. I mean, I don't Yeah, I, I'm telling you, it, there was it was the it's birth like of these troll farms now. now. There were history farms somewhere. Yeah. They were just I mean, like yeah, that's good. Make that I, shit up. I think the 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 idea of putting history and um, you know giving your uh, well, you see it today. Obviously, distilleries adding a history to their new brand. Well, uh, I, I, and I, I it's not just an American thing. You see it. I, I can tell you exactly, Lou, why this is going on. It starts in the 1850s when they invented the lithograph. All of a sudden, print went from black and white to color. Ooh. Advertising starts to take off, but it's interrupted by this little thing called the American Civil War. The war is over. Things are being rebuilt. 1870s, you start having real advertising firms, mm. marketing firms, and they make the shit up. Well, is this also when we start? Is this also when we start doing public education, and they need textbooks. Yes, I think I think that might have something to do with. I mean, just yeah, the amount of stuff that seems to have been made up from like 1870 to about 1895 is amazing. <laughs> and they just go back and like, yeah, there's no mention of this shit in the hundred years or two hundred years since it was supposed to have happened until now. Well, just, but also think of how, I mean, I don't, in fact, this is something we should get into, Mike, uh, and, and as well as you two, since you, you guys do your, uh, your own writings, um, you know, research, think about how tough it would have been to actually research back then. And I was just reading recently about um, how the British during the American Revolution, this one guy, Tarlington, uh, oh, yeah. was actually who's, going around. Tarlington? Yeah, he was he was actually destroying a lot of um, records, mm. right? You know, on purpose he was burning them, and so you think about it. I mean, it would be a bitch. Well, the Civil War was not kind of records either, and 
uh, in the southern states. You know, a lot of courthouses got burned. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I mean, my um, sorry, my bro my brother in law is the head of the archives at Colonial Williamsburg and worked at the Virginia State Archives before that. Part of his job <laughs> was recovering southern archives from northern families because these guys just grabbed shit and stuck it in their pack right, and took right. it off. It's freaking souvenirs. Right. Yeah. He got like a whole county's records from this family in Connecticut. Yeah. They're like, yeah, we thought this might be yours. <laughs> <laughs> and he's going to go up there and say, thank you. Thank huh. you. <laughs> ah! Well, it's the spoils of war. Yeah. And he did oh, yeah. In yeah. Supposed yeah, to well, this is saying. the same guy who'd like zip up into a Tyvek suit and go into like attics full of pigeon shit and get records. Yeah. Yeah. At so. least they were saved. You know, my, my horror story yeah. is that before I started at uh, Old Fitzgerald, the people from Shin Lee had gone in there and hauled out two dump trucks full of old records to the, uh, to the landfill. Wow. Uh, well, Mike, the archives you created, I don't know if you guys ever got a chance to see the archives at Stutzelweller uh, before they were moved, but it was really impressive. It was like Raiders of the Lost Ark, kind yeah. of warehouse, you know, just rows of boxes and files, and and now all that has been moved to some uh, clandestine underground bunker that Diageo has built. No, that... They didn't build. It's, it's, there's an underground storage area that's an old limestone quarry underneath the Louisville Zoo, and they have rented uh, yeah, uh, a storage space there. Wow. So that's where it all is? Yeah. Liz. What they didn't take overseas. Liz, they took, a, couple, they took a cargo container worth of records overseas, which I did, thought they never should have done. Why would they bring them over? I know that they have archives over in Scotland, but why would they bring American? Uh, I guess it was it's the company, it's yeah. the United Distillers, now Diageo. So they put it, they have the big main archive there, which is also very impressive. Yeah. Um, Liz, you don't still have your Diageo secret password card? No, unfortunately not. <laughs> yeah, they took, they took mine that. off me once I left. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so something maybe we could dig into, and I'm you know curious, you know your thoughts, and I'm thinking about, uh, you know, a lot of people are wanting to go uh, dig into pre-prohibition um, whiskeys and try and recreate them, uh, mash bills, uh, and Right, Fiona right, is doing that over in Ireland. How much of that do you get involved in? And have you seen that kind of, um, you know, pick up lately? I, I've actually written a couple of blogs on this. Okay. So, you know, follow my website, bourbonbeach.com. Um, Which, by the way, there should be a link uh, below um, to that very website. So my blog. And, and, and it's funny because I uh, went back and posted on Facebook and Twitter and uh, LinkedIn today my article called 19th Century Whiskey or Bourbon. And it talks about this type of stuff. But, um, you know, there's a lot of things about 19th Century Whiskey that I tried to recreate when Bill Thomas and I made four mm -hmm. barrels of whiskey out of Kentucky Artisan Distillers. Okay. Uh, one thing that I, uh, when we agreed to do this, uh, the first thing is, is I wanted to use a uh, heritage corn that my grandfather used to raise. And I found out when he died in 1974 that uh, during the 30s and 40s, he made moonshine. So I know that he would have used this to make his moonshine. That's hickory cane yeah. white corn. So we made 60% hickory cane white corn. Mm. We did 25% rye. And uh, we use 12% regular distiller's malt. And then the, the 21st century twist on it is I use 3% chocolate malt. Okay. And um, Jay yeah. Jameson, uh, after double distillation, the, the proof was 119.5. And then it went into the barrel at 103 proof. Okay. 
So this is like, you know, uh, 19th century whiskey, as close as I could. Yeah. Remember. Well, would that have been a used barrel then, Mike? It could have been, but not likely. Because most distillers, their primary package for selling the whiskey was the barrel in the 19th century. You know, it's not until the 1890s that glass becomes affordable enough that distillers can start bottling their own product. You know, if you wanted to buy whiskey, you went to your saloon or your liquor dealer and you took your own jug or your own flask or bottle and you bought your pint or quart right out of the barrel. So that's why the distillers put it into the barrel at a proof that people could drink somewhere mm -hmm. between 90 and 105. Mm. That makes sense. They were stronger people back then. <laughs> stronger constitutions. Well, and uh, we put it into the barrel at 103, mostly because we wanted to make sure that it would stay above 100 proof because we were talking about doing it as a bottled and bond when we uh, bottled it. But I was very tempted to put it in at like 90 proof and see what happened. So how long was it in the barrel? Uh, it'll be four years again. But anyway, to finish my story, since the barrel was the primary package, distillers would sell you know, five barrels of whiskey to St. Louis, to some bar in St. Louis or some dealer in St. Louis, they're not getting those barrels back. So if they want to make five more barrels, they got to buy new ones. Yeah, there were a few used barrels that they could buy from local people that emptied the barrels. But for the most part, they were getting brand new barrels. Well, all right. I, I would have thought they want to do uh, the economic way, especially in the late 1800s. I mean, you had a lot of folks. It was just as cheap a lot to make new barrels it was to refurbish it over. Mm. Refurbished. So lacquered. It did happen. As a matter of fact, there's a letter in the uh, uh, at the Filson in the uh, le a letter book from uh, uh, the OSC distillery E. H. Taylor. And he's getting a, he gets a complaint from Augustus Lebro out of Cincinnati who bought a hundred barrels from him. And one of the barrels, the whiskey was bad. And he's complaining about it. So Taylor writes him and says, send the barrel to us, we'll examine it, and we you know, and if we find that it is bad for some reason, we'll give you a new barrel of whiskey. So he gets back, and evidently they do their test, their thing, and he writes back to uh, Augustus Lebrow again, says, you were right, it was bad, because when they re refurbished this barrel, they stopped the leak using a piece of leather and a tack, and that iron tack oh, messed no. up the whiskey. Yeah, well, you had a little iron in your whiskey. It's good well, for yeah. you. Makes you grow well, 12 ways. <laughs> Green, yeah, so, black. Yeah. Wonder whiskey. A little leather. Mm, there's a bit of leathery tackiness to it. Nice. <laughs> hey, so now your classes, you still teach. You're, you will do a condensed I am, I am class. I am the people hopefully this fall when restrictions uh, are lifted. And where would this be, Mike? Where well, I'm, ta I'm talking to several people. Uh, 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 Art Eatables here in Louisville wants to do it. Um, Todd Leopold and I are talking about doing it out in Denver at the Leopold Brothers. Wow. Um, I am also talking with uh, Alan Bishop, the Spirit of French Lick Distillery uh, in Indiana, and Jason Fruits uh, from the old 55 Distillery up in northern Indiana. Um, nice. The Philadelphia Bourbon Society has been talking to me about it. I, you know, they've been talking from before the. Uh, pandemic we actually planned on one and it got canceled because of the pandemic yeah i remember that and um they want to they say they want to do it you know reschedule it but i haven't heard anything from them for a while and then the augusta Bur bourbon society down in georgia is talking to me about possibly doing it so if it's, uh, say a whiskey group or even a distillery wanted you to come to their place do an eight hour very informative class, usually tasting a lot of bourbon, folks. Yeah, keep that in mind. Uh, what what is required? How much? 
Do they have to pay you? Okay. Do what they have I to did. fly in? Private helicopter? What? <laughs> they have to. Uh, yeah, none uh, of these pay, public helicopters. Pay, pay traveling expenses. So, you know, like Denver, they're going to have to buy me, you know, plane ticket, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to have to furnish a place to hold it, of course, the room. Oh, well, I thought you meant the plane. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They're going to have to furnish glassware and they're going to have to furnish lunch. Yes, Glen Cairn glasses. <laughs> um, even though I will be uh, 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 bringing Glen Cairn glasses with me and uh, offering them for sale to people um, in the class. But uh, then I charge a, a $1,000 fee, flat fee. And then they can set it up, sell tickets for whatever, you know, if they end up making $10,000 off of it, that's fine to, as far as I'm concerned, as long as I get my fee. And <laughs> well, that's very mercenary of you. As yeah. long as I get my fee. They can make as much as they want. I, you know, I don't want them to see, lose money on it. Obviously, that's reasonable. But, no, it's well uh, worth it. Well, I mean, that's a reasonable fee. And, um, uh, uh, it, it is an eight-hour class. I start off talking uh, 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 early bourbon history up to uh, 1821 was the first mention of bourbon. Then we taste uh, uh, a new make whiskey and an aged American brandy, usually from Copper and Kings, because of my theory that bourbon is na uh, comes about because of aged brandy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then I do 19th century from 1821 up to bottled and bond. Um, and then we taste a traditional bourbon made with rye and a weeded bourbon. Then we break for lunch. Then we do uh, from bottled and bond up to the end of uh, prohibition repeal. And then we do a rye whiskey and a Tennessee whiskey to do a comparison of other whiskeys to bourbon. Then we do from repeal to uh, modern times, and we taste a single barrel and a small batch. And then I always uh, uh, have a blind tasting at the end, and I ask them to tell me, what do you think? Is this a bourbon, rye, Tennessee whiskey, brandy? Uh, do you think it is a, uh, uh, if it is a bourbon, is it a traditional or weeded? Uh, what proof do you think it is? How old do you think it is? And if you're really good, can you tell me the brand? <laughs> That's brave. Yeah. They get a certificate, don't they? Hey, actually, talk about brave. I did this at Jack Rose, and we had mm -hmm. three women from the Kentucky Society of Washington, D.C. in the audience as part of the, in the class. All three of them guessed the brand. <laughs> Ooh. I was impressed. <laughs> That's very impressive. Yes. I usually try to guess it wrong, Jess, so I'm not showing off. <laughs> that helps out glasses? Mm -hmm. yeah, well, kind of. No, but I just say, oh, I have a cold. <laughs> I have a cold today. Sorry. Um, and then, Mike, you do a, uh, what's the steamboat? class you do i it's well it's not so much a class it's a uh, uh uh the american queen steamboat company do bourbon cruises they've got two this year that i'm signed up to do uh, they're from memphis to louisville eight eight day classes or, or trips where they tour a lot of bourbon distilleries and visit a lot of towns in between and i'm part of the entertainment i guess you could say i do uh uh uh, several bourbon lectures on the history of bourbon, and uh, I always do a, uh, a, a little contest between, you know, they've got, on the American Queen, they've got four bars with four bartenders. So Rosemary and I go around and uh, uh, taste all the Manhattans from each of the bartenders, and we award the best uh, Manhattan on the boat uh, towards the end of the trip. If you're still standing... <laughs> yeah, well, sir. So yeah, it, uh, it's not a cheap trip. Uh, uh, you know, steamboat cruises are 
more expensive than an ocean cruise because you're limited in the amount of people you can get on there. I think the American Queen is the largest and it has a capacity of like 425 passengers. Okay. But it is a very fun trip. Uh, uh, I much prefer it over a uh, ocean cruise. You get to know the other passengers better. You get to know the crew. Uh, the food is as good as anything that you would eat in a, a, a fancy restaurant in Louisville. I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. you know, and even their buffet has prime rib uh, uh, like three days out of the eight. <laughs> wow. Well, I'll have to go down that lazy river at some yeah. point. That'd be fine. I'm trying to tuck my wife into one of the uh, Rhine River cruises. I want to do the, the Viking cruise yeah. in Eastern Europe. That'd be so Oh, cool. well, no. I mean, Viking does one on the Rhine. Uh, we were actually, she and I were in Cologne when they were docked there. It was pretty cool. I mean, it looked like they were having a good time. Well, they do one on the Danube. Yeah. Which yeah. Is really nice. Actually, I think yeah. Viking does one from Amsterdam up the Rhine. Uh, through the canal that connects the Rhine to the Danube and then all the way down to the Black Sea. Oh, wow. Uh, folks, you have just joined uh, uh, Cruise Vacations uh, already in progress. Yeah, we are now calling the show Old Guys on Boats. Yeah. Um, <laughs> hey, let me tell you, the Bourbon Cruise, though, is a lot of fun. They always, uh, Bill Samuels is usually uh, gets on in Owensboro and takes it to uh, uh, Louisville and does uh, uh, actually goes on the bus with them when they tour Maker's Mark. Is he uh, hijacking it when you say he takes it? I mean, let's see, get out of here. Give me that weed. We are talking about Bill Samuels here, so that's entirely yeah. within the realm. Yeah. <laughs> was, yeah. uh, long pimp outfits and stuff. Yeah. yeah they usually have uh, somebody from Buffalo Trace on board uh, uh, doing talks. Uh, um, they have lots of other entertainment. Uh, the first year I was on there, they had a Mark Twain impersonator that was just like really good. And I wish they had, had him for every one of my cruises. Uh, he, during my talks, he always asked the best questions. <laughs> you sure it just wasn't Hal Holbrook before he died? Hey, let me tell you, this guy was as good as Hal Holbrook. Yeah? He's actually a retired uh, Kentucky State Trooper that lives in Cynthia. <laughs> He sounds just like Mark Twain, which I don't know if anyone really knows what Mark Twain sounds like, though. Actually, I think they do have a recording of this. I, I believe they do have a recording. Oh. He was good friends with Edison. Yeah. He sounds like this. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Can't uh, get there from here. So I, I had a question, but before we do, um, just a number of folks are saying hello. So Christina Wolf. Berlin. Thanks for joining again. Tom H says hi from Chicago. Chicago. Wood. Haley from Colorado. He also said um, go GGDs. Yeah. Uh, Kathleen says greetings from SoCal. Steve Kane says hello from Arizona. And Brad Krause. Hey, Brad. Thanks for joining again from Panama. Panama. Panama Brad. That's what we call him. <laughs> So I use my, a Panama Brad hat all the time. <laughs> so my question was back to, you know, you did some archiving at private companies. You also, you know, did more, um, you know, e equal opportunity, I guess we'll call it, <laughs> um, archiving. And your experience, how much information has been lost with privatization of archives? Because I'm just reflecting back on, you know, some of your comments of, um, you know, Seagram's research, for example, where it's like, it sits in a box and then it just sits there and people kind right. of lose access to it. So I don't know if you yeah, can- Yeah, it really depends upon the, uh, the company. Uh, you know, there are some companies, you know, I think Coca-Cola archives are very accessible to the public. Hmm. Um, you know, but it really depends upon the company and how much, de you know, dedication they have to the process. Uh, but I always encourage uh, uh, a lot of companies that don't can't afford an archive or something, you know, 
donate it to the, the Filson Historical Society or the Kentucky yeah. Historical Society. Make it available to the public. You know, e even private individuals. You know, a lot of the information at the Filson came to us through private individuals. Uh, the E.H. Taylor papers came from the Taylor Hay family because, you know, they went, Taylor brought all of his old OFC records with him when he left uh, the Stag Distillery yeah. and it sat in the family's, you know, house for years. And, uh, um, but the thing is, though, if it's sitting in a private home or a private business and researchers can't have access to it, it's worthless. That's lost. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it might as well be in the landfill. Yeah. Uh, donate it to these places. You know, you can get a, an appraisal of what these, these papers are worth and take a tax cut off. I actually, uh, I did that as part of my library degree. I did a collection of paper, private papers from a uh, a peony grower. Mm. I was, I was, I did an internship at the Hunt Botanical Archives in Pittsburgh. Yeah, yeah. Was, and I mean, you know, at the time, I didn't realize it, but a lot of these people have really valuable information, and it's not always exactly what you think you're looking for. I mean, this guy is one of these people that get up every morning and wrote down what the weather was. And yeah. somebody came by and wanted to know, you know, well, what climate was. Well, and they're like, we heard here, that. Here, here's an example. The most significant paper in bourbon history that I have ever found is in a collection of family papers. It had nothing to do with distilling um, after, you know, the Civil War, for sure. And it's the Corliss Respis family papers. John Corliss mm -hmm. actually starts up in Providence, Rhode Island in the shipping business, but he owned a gin distillery up there. Oh. He gets into trouble when two of his ships are seized by the Spanish, one off the coast of Chile and the other one off the coast of uh, uh, Argentina, maybe, uh, somewhere along in there. But anyway, he gets two ships that are seized about the same time. Uh, and then to make matters worse for him, the South American revolution happens. So the Spanish government saying, that's not our problem anymore. You need to talk to the new government. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like 40 years before he gets any uh, uh, type of settlement on this. So oh in 1815, God. he sells everything he has and moves to Kentucky and buys land including a small distiller. And he's making some whiskey. Uh, uh, this is one of the reasons why we know about the cost of whiskey. Because every year he goes down to New Orleans and he's selling tobacco. Because wow. that's his real cash crop. And they're uh -huh. sending him back prices of, of other things such as whiskey. But anyway, there's a letter in there from a Lexington grocer. You could read Wholesaler today who says, I really like your whiskey. I'll take another 10 barrels as you make them. But I've been told that if you will burn or char the inside of the of the barrel as little as a 16th of an inch, it will greatly improve the flavor. But I will leave that up to you as the distiller to make this decision. This was 1825. So here is a Lexington grocer telling a Bourbon County distiller, because he was bought the land in Bourbon County, how to make bourbon. So the idea of bourbon is a new idea in the 1820s. Yeah. Well, see, you know, so this is what has always fascinated me about all you writer types, all three of you. Though, of course, where's my book? I did some oh, research yeah. my own for the evil French. Sure. Don't but, sign so short. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but um, I, uh, I've always been fascinated, you know, when you write and research, especially history and going back, you know, uh, we, you, uh, Liz, you mentioned Fiona O'Connor over in Ireland. That guy is constantly oh, yeah. wandering that island, so, you know, going through archives and going through letters and probably family letters. You know, if someone's even suspected of being a distiller, you go through their stuff and you try to find 
mash bills and yeah, and you may spend ten seats. hours going through there to find one document, but sometimes that document's worth that ten hours. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's tough. I mean, how'd you do that, Mike? After you left Stitzel, well, you had the you had all those records at your disposal from uh, United Distillers, I'm assuming, uh, yeah. and all those various brands. How afterwards? How do you go about finding this stuff? Well, fortunately, like I said, the Filson, you know, they date back to the late 1870s themselves. So they have a lot of old papers and and such and, and family papers. You got to remember, between 1817 and 1861, there was no tax on whiskey in America, no federal tax. So there is no federal record of distilleries. The distillery records that we have come from private individuals. And a lot of these individuals donated to the Filson. So, you know, there's a lot of material in there dealing with it uh, uh, from family papers. You know, the earliest uh, whiskey license to, uh, to distill uh, during the first whiskey tax of 1799 for Evan Williams is in the Filson and the William, Finley Williams family papers. Huh. Uh, yeah, which is interesting too because you know they what is it they say he is uh, 1783 is uh, where he was the first distiller. Well, they also they they also had his uh, receipt for his boat boat passage to the United States from 1784. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, but I, I'm not holding that against Heaven, uh, Heaven Hill because it was actually one of the Filson's founders that started that story about Evan Williams being the first. <laughs> because he was he was one that wanted the first of everything to be from Louisville. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God, is that a wow? That is such yeah. a driving force. Yeah, you know? that continues today. Yeah, you have yeah, the yeah, two black distilleries in Kentucky. Girl. Michael, uh, you have two of uh, the uh, the two black distilleries right now arguing over who's the, who's first, the first black distillery in Kentucky, and it's like <laughs> really kind of about the same time. I wouldn't worry about it too much, you know. But uh, Reuben T. Durrett uh, has a great uh, quote in one of his letters in the Filson papers, the Durrett papers. And he's writing about artifacts and, and papers at the Filson. And he says, every artifact has a great story, and we shouldn't let the truth get behind, uh, get in the way of it. <laughs> Have you ever talked to Chester Zoller? Oh, yeah. About his book? Oh, yeah. I helped him do a lot of research. Oh, did you? Him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I found that really interesting just because it, yeah. uh, it's a, bur it was a, a bourbon in Kentucky. Yeah. That's the name of the book. Mm, and it's, right. he researches every distillery that ever existed as far as he could find. Right. And it's like about 200 distilleries. Oh, I'm not there's mistaken. more than that. Yeah. Well, I know he put out a second edition. Well, more. Here, for an example, in Kentucky, before Prohibition, there were over 460 brandy distilleries. Plus another twenty Damn. whiskey distilleries that were making brandy as well. Oh, and <laughs> hey, were you going to do a book called you know about American brandy? Uh, that, it's on my radar. I want to do it. Uh, find time <laughs> to do it. You know, I'm writing a lot of blogs and such. <laughs> You're writing but, a lot of blogs. Uh, and such. Those will be archived forever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I I will say. Um, both uh, my boyfriend and I are huge fans of actually going to um, historical uh, records of Filson as well as um, the library in Milwaukee. Actually, we've it's a great place to find old photos um, that you can you know reprint. So we've got um, tons of old Paps photos in our apartment. So for those of you on the scout, I would highly recommend. Um, you know, spending some time uh, in the archives because you can, yeah, as you mentioned, find some some cool gems. Did, did you say you go to Milwaukee? Yeah, it's it. So my boyfriend's a brewer, so he he's uh, 
really obsessed with some of the old photos. So we've got some old um, photos from Rainierbury, um, from Paps, and we've all found these at, you know, um, at archives. Well, when you go to Milwaukee, find a the oldest city directory that you can and find John E. Fitzgerald. Okay. <laughs> there are two that I have found. One of them was a uh, uh, tax collector, you know, the story that Heaven Hill is using. That is a, a fairly legitimate. But there was also a Johnny Fitzgerald who was a boiler maker. Mm. I personally think that he might be the one that Johnny Fitzgerald is named after because <laughs> If he's working on the boiling heating systems in the bourbon warehouses in Milwaukee, uh, he'd have more opportunity to take his mule out and take a few sips. So what I would like to do is find uh, city directories because they'll tell usually the city directory will tell you when you find the person, you know, where they work. Mm. And I would like to find out which one of these guys was actually working mm. for SC Hertz. Hey, uh, hey, Liz. So you wrote, you put something in uh, about yeah. Steve Kane's question. Yeah, we have a, a question from from Steve Kane. Uh, where do you suggest someone can find archives on old distilleries? For example, I'm trying to find more about uh, Clark Brothers in Peoria, Illinois, once known as Whiskey City. True. True. Uh, well, the place to start, of course, is going to be Peoria. You think? <laughs> The next place to go is the Illinois State Archive. Oh, good point. Yeah. Um, and is that in? I would look for, you know, unfortunately, these, you know, the records as a whole are going to be private. They're going to be whoever owned those companies keeps right. those records, even when they go out of business. So unless they donated them to some place or another, they're not going to be part of the public record. But one thing that you should never forget to look at, and uh, uh, I highly recommend Brian Harrah's book on this, look at legal cases. Oh, the uh, get a lot of legal problems, and they end up in the courts. Interesting. You know what I also think would box. be a good place is old uh, resale shops, only because um, – I used to work in an antique mall in my youth, and uh, it was amazing how many personal items, uh, you know, at estate sales. So if, say right. someone at a company, uh, and there was a, tons of really interesting things. I couldn't believe, I, I assume they had no more family, um, even though somebody had to or, be benefiting from the estate sale, but um, uh, you get some amazing archives. Or a lot of times it's the grandchildren, you know, don't care about grandpa's right. old records and, you know, sell them. You know, we get a few bucks for them, we'll take it. Uh, but that's, uh, how much do you know about Peoria, Mike? Do you, have you ever really looked into? Peoria was a lot, there was a lot of distilling going on in there mm -hmm. before Prohibition. And then uh, that was kind of the heart of the whiskey raid. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then uh, uh, they became uh, very much involved in the Whiskey Trust. And then after Prohibition, uh, Hiram Walker built a huge distillery there right after Prohibition. Uh, at the time it was built, it was the biggest whiskey distillery in, in the world. And then what happened? Oh, geez. Oh, what happened to Hiram Walker? You we know? stopped drinking whiskey. Yeah, mm -hmm. people stopped drinking whiskey. Yeah, I guess so. Vodka happened. Yeah, but Hiram Walker, weren't they making vodka too? They were making other. Yeah. Well, you got to remember, uh, there were a lot of things that caused the decline, and it's not just vodka. You know, one of the biggest problems, and Bill Samuels and I had this conversation, because he really, he's the one that really pointed out. It's one mistake of it in my book whenever I do a rewrite on it. Uh, the 50s was a golden age of, for bourbon for the consumer, but it wasn't for the distillers. Mm. Shinley 
overproduced so much during the mm -hmm. Korean War. They started shutting down distilleries when the war ended because they had more whiskey than they could sell. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they owned like eight or ten in Kentucky at that time, and they all got shut down except for Burnham and Stag, you know, by the end of the 1960s. Um, they would have gone bankrupt if Rosenstiel hadn't convinced the government to increase the bonding period from eight years to 20. Mm -hmm. So what happened in the 1960s, since Shinley didn't go bankrupt, uh, they kept the price of whiskey artificially low because they had all this whiskey they needed to sell. <laughs> and this caused hardship on all the other small distilleries because they couldn't afford to keep the price low and stay in business. No. So they ended up going out of business. Freaking capitalism, man. Yeah. And uh, 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 still better for whiskey than communism. The only answer that the other big distilleries had was, was well, let's keep our, our prices low, too. You know, mm -hmm. and it basically cheapened the reputation of bourbon. Yeah. And it almost killed rye. Which is funny. I mean, trying to maintain that because now I have, I know so many people I've met and heard from so many people just in the last couple of weeks who are asking, hey, where can I either buy or sell? Some real high end bourbons, you know. Everyone is just all about that now, and I always think one of the big shames about even Scotch and now even Irish whiskey is, you know, it was the drink of mm. the working man of the common guy, and uh, you know, as soon as something becomes hot, all of a sudden it's the common man can't afford it anymore. That, and I'm I, the I common man. That's, yeah, that's oscillated throughout history, right? It's that's something where it's been, you know, very high end and then, you know, blue collar. Yeah. I mean, the famous story about lobsters being prison food in Maine. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Prisoners literally complaining because they were eating lobster too often. I said, my lobster is overcooked. <laughs> and my shrimp were kind of mushy. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up and eat them. What is with this Prosecco you're serving? <laughs> Probably oxidized. I mean, yeah. it's oxidized. I think that was uh, kind of corked. Um, hey, uh, what's that, Mike? Liz, you want to read that? I can't get my. Yeah. Um, so Patrick asks Mike, where can I get info about the old Commonwealth Hoffman Distillery in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky? Well, what do they want to know about it? The one that Julian Van Winkle bought, uh, it was the place where Ezra Brooks was first distilled and made. Uh, uh, it's one of many small distilleries that basically went out of business in the 60s uh, because of the falling prices of whiskey and, and such. Uh, they were started up in the 40s, uh, probably uh, uh, right after the war, I believe. Not a whole lot to know about. It was a small distillery that flooded a lot. <laughs> you think some of their whiskey, because it was inexpensive, might still be out there somewhere? Oh, there's a, Julian Van Winkle gets calls all the time about this. Uh, uh, I forget what the brand is, but it's... Uh, 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 Hoffman distilled stuff. It's like 12 years old and everything. And he says it's god awful because the warehouses there flooded so much and it, it, all their whiskey oh, got musty. Got all musty. <laughs> yeah. musty it, it was, it's it's labeled as a collector's item. So the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> don't drink it. Just collect this item. Just collect, Just collect it. it. Yeah. So, um, Mike, guys, I, 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 I hate to, I'm going to have to leave my, my dog your that's stung by a bee and he's not looking good. Yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna run. You take Sorry, care of them. Mike. It was good to see you. Go, always a pleasure, Lou. Oh well, oh well. Next time you're in Louisville, come on yeah, down and have yeah. a drink on my porch. <laughs> Sounds like a great idea. It's a I'll good thing. Yeah, ask Marty. You know, the best place to drink bourbon. We all have none of us have enough whiskey, right? That's yeah. <laughs> it's a good porch, though. Uh, all right, guys. Bye, Lewis. Be good. Take care, Pooch. Thanks.
So uh, when uh, Scotty Davidson from Glen Cairn was down there, but was uh, 2019, yeah, uh, and you brought out cigars, yeah. He, Scott really doesn't smoke cigars, but he wanted to fit in. Uh, between the cigars and the bourbon, uh, he threw up in his Uber on his way back <laughs> to the steel pocket. <laughs> Poor little fella. Poor little Scottish guy just going, oh, get, stop the car, stop it. Oh, too late. Uh, so, Mike, what do you think about the, uh, I mean, Kentucky's really exploded with distilleries over the last uh, 10 years. I yeah. mean, what was it? It was the big nine for a while, but now it's how many? I, I really don't know. I mean, there's, it seems like there's a new one opening every day. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of them, uh, and it's great. Uh, the way I look at it, uh, I, I, this is what I was telling people when they were looking to get into the business uh, five years ago. I said, you know, hang around a couple of years before you get into it. You can probably buy uh, all the equipment cheap because uh, the ones that are in it to make a fast buck are probably not going to make it and they're going to be selling their equipment. <laughs> well, I did, well, I was just down there as, as you were. You were at the opening of the new um, log still distillery from the Dant family. Yeah. Kind of the famous Kentucky bourbon family. And they were making a small town, basically. They're even building a train station, yeah. a local train track, an amphitheater. They already have a small distillery and tasting room, but now they're building a big distillery. I mean, a lot of money going into some of these. And, you know, I suppose you've got some small guys, yeah. but I don't know. I've never seen a real, well, no, I. I have seen a couple of small ones, really small ones, but most of them are There's some well really funded. good whiskey being made at some small distilleries here. Uh, John Pogue at the Old Pogue Distillery is making really good whiskey, and it's literally um, started off he was making a barrel a week. Now I think he's up to like a barrel a day. Oh, wow. um, nice. But it, it, it's good whiskey. Well, uh, everyone down in Kentucky, you know, what I was is, say, Rhodes is Rocky Roads is uh, available for the consultation. Her link is below. I, I was what I was drinking here today is this Lincoln Pinch uh, from the Dueling Grounds Distillery. Two-year-old whiskey, but it's really good. Can you hold that up to your camera, Mike? Wow, that's a nice looking label. I like that label. Yeah. It's uh, a, well, uh, what uh, what's in the whiskey? What's uh, it's a bourbon? And, what? Uh, it's you know got a great nose, lots of caramel, a little ripe apple, a little green apple actually too, and uh, smoke and some vanilla. That's a straight bourbon. It's a straight bourbon, two year right. old. They've actually got a bottled and bond. I didn't grab that bottle. They actually have been around long enough now. They got a bottle of bond that's even better than this. But you bought that bottle? I would have thought people just send them to you. Well, actually, the bottle of bond was sent to me. This one here, I I, I bought this one. I bought this one because I hadn't seen it and I wanted to try it, you know. And I and I do try to buy the stuff from the small craft distilleries because I want to support them. You know, if they don't make money, they don't exist. So. Uh, so I bought it, did a review. The guy really liked the review. And uh, he says, I'm coming out with a bottle and bond. Would you like me to send you a bottle? And I said, sure, you do it. And I'll review it. And I did. And it's good whiskey. All right. All right. Well, well, Mikey, what's, what are you doing next? What's your next what? big thing? Well, I've got the in, last week, uh, full week of June, I'm going on the American Queen. Uh, working on the, the blog. Um, uh, and what's the blogs? Uh, uh, people who read Bur bourbonbeach.com. I do basically three blogs a week. Uh, I do a uh, Monday blog that could be just about anything. Uh, on Wednesday, I call it Tasting Wednesday. I always do a tasting note, uh, with my nephew Matt now. He's joined me. Um, oh, that's who Matt is. Yeah. And um, uh, then on Fridays, I do a flashback Friday where me and Matt taste a uh, 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 an old bottle of something or another. Then uh, 
the second Friday, I always do a image of the past, find something I find, the, some historical image or something, and I do a little blog on that. On the third uh, Friday, I always do a cocktail blog of some type. And uh, the last Friday, I always do book reviews because, uh, you know, one of my goals in keeping this blog is to make it something that researchers can go to and hopefully find uh, information um, for for something, you know, uh, if nothing else, where to look for information. And book reviews, I think, is a very important thing to have. There you uh, go, Michael and Steve. Yeah. Um, and uh, on, a, on the occasional fifth Friday, I just sit down and decide I'll come up with something and then do it. Animal. Yeah. Well, folks can find your book on Amazon. I don't know if you sell it right. on your website. And you well. can see, get my um, tasting books, uh, Bourbon Tasting Notebook and the American Whiskey Tasting Notebook. I wrote with uh, Susan Rigor. Uh, our cool. idea of when I was approached about doing a tasting book, I said I wouldn't do it unless I could do it with Susan Regor because I wanted to write a book where you have a man's point of view and a woman's point of view. And I and, think it's worked out really well. And who, folks who don't know, Susan is one of the co-founders of Bourbon Women as well as an author in her own right. Right. All right. Well, Michael, thank you for being on uh, with us. This has been enlightening. As ever, Liz feels like she's actually... Now knows history past the last. I, I certainly have learned a ton. Um, that's what the show's about. So thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Um, well, read my book, book, Liz. I, 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 <laughs> I will. You need to read my book. <laughs> Mike's very subtle. He has very subtle <laughs> selling technique. Yeah. But Liz, if you're ever here in Louisville, let me know. Uh, like I said, my porch is the best place to drink some bourbon. You and your husband or boyfriend or whatever are more welcome to Thank come. You. And... Yeah, that, that sounds lovely. Um, I, I'm just eager to, to get back out traveling and um, having a drink with people in yeah. person. So thank you so much. Well, we're both vaccinated, so. <laughs> um. So so skipping ahead to next week, actually just introducing our, our guests for next Tuesday. Um, we have Ian Chang and Edward Ludlow of Caruzawa Distillers. So oh, say that again. I'm sorry. <laughs> what was it? Uh, Caruzawa. Very good. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. I practiced um, before the show. So I it'll be a fun show again next week. Um, so please come back, sign up, and hang out with us next Tuesday. Yes, talking Japanese whiskey, everyone. All right, thanks, Michael. Thank yeah, thanks, Michael. thanks, everyone. Cheers. Bye, Cheers. Take care.